All right, we're going to get started. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good. We're getting close to the end of school. The sun is shining for about another 12 hours, and then we're going to get some snow. Well, friends, welcome. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University, and I direct our think tank here at the university called the Centennial Institute. We're so grateful that you're joining us. This is our monthly Distinguished Lecture Series where we explore different issues, um, especially issues that are kind of in the news and, uh, and uh, relevant to kind of what we're experiencing, what we're living today. So um, welcome. If this is your first time to Colorado Christian University, we're so glad to have you. Um, as we begin, we always like to begin with prayer and pledge from our 1776 scholars. So if you can, please stand to join me in prayer led by Mira Hughes and the pledge by Kendall Peterson. Patterson, thank you. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time that we could all come together and have this opportunity to hear from Dr. Wilcox tonight. Help us to be able to listen not only with our ears, but with our hearts and minds as well. Please bless these marriages represented here tonight, as well as all the future marriages of our student body. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. You may be seated. So at Colorado Christian University, it is a strategic priority. So it's actually written down. It's a strategic priority of Colorado Christian University to impact our culture in support of traditional family values. That is why we are proud today to host one of the nation's top researchers on the connection between healthy families and a flourishing society. Dr. Brad Wilcox is the director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia and a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. Congratulations on the big win last night. <laughs> that was a great game. Um, he is a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and a senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. As an undergraduate, Wilcox was a Jefferson scholar at the University of Virginia and later earned his PhD from Princeton University. Prior to coming to the University of Virginia, he held research fellowships at Princeton University, Yale University, and the Brookings Institution. His research has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the Washington Post, Times, CNN, NBC's The Today Show, and numerous NPR stations. He has authored or edited five books. Dr. Wilcox and his wife, Danielle, have been married for 23 years, and together they are raising nine children. Please welcome renowned sociologist, Dr. Brad Wilcox. Thanks, Jeff, for that gracious introduction. And I've got my uh, UVA tie on today. Very happy about last night's championship. You know, we, we'd lost in the first round of the tournament last year. It was a pretty, pretty dispiriting loss, which hit our team and our coach, you know, really hard. Um, but since then, they've really worked hard to, to turn it around. And so that was an especially sweet victory um, last night. So I'm talking tonight about America's marriage divide. Um, and, you know, I think when you're sort of thinking about marriage today um, and what's sort of happening to marriage today, you know, if you're like me, you might become a little confused. You know, if you're just kind of standing in the checkout line at your local grocery store, scanning the cover of InTouch or People Magazine to kind of see the latest, you know, you might be forgiven for thinking that marriage is in trouble in the elite precincts of, Mer of America. So from Brangelina to the Kardashians, from Jeff Bezos to Anthony Weiner, things look pretty rough in the marriage department, it might seem, among the rich and famous. But you know, if you kind of start looking at this issue more seriously, what you see is that the privileged and powerful in America are actually doing pretty well. Jeff Bezos is an outlier. He's not kind of, you know, the norm. So what we're actually seeing in America is that we're increasingly separate and unequal when it comes to marriage um, by class. So college educated and more affluent Americans tend to enjoy relatively high quality and stable marriages. 
By contrast, working class and poor Americans are more likely to be struggling in the family department. They're more likely to be moving in and out of relationships, more likely to be having single parent families um, dominate the lives of their children. And then, of course, they're facing the economic and social fallout of this family instability uh, as well. So again, this is kind of the marriage divide that I'm talking about tonight. And I kind of give you a picture of what this looks like. I've got a few slides kind of just illustrating the demographic trends here. Um, and what they show us is that when it comes to marriage, for instance, you know, who is married? Um, again, the folks who are kind of in the upper half of the distribution um, are typically married, whereas working class Americans just below that middle spot are not, a majority of them are not married. And of course, um, people who are poor in America are the least likely uh, to be married. When it comes to divorce, there's a pretty uh, dramatic difference in marital stability, as this slide here tells us. What we can see is that um, you know, across the country, there's been a decline in divorce since the 70s, but that decline has really been most dramatic for college-educated Americans on the right here of this slide. And what you can see here also is that they are much less likely to get divorced compared to Americans who've got a high school degree or some college in the middle or Americans or high school dropouts here on the left of the slide. So again, what this is sort of showing us is that marital stability is much, much more common for college-educated Americans and for affluent Americans more generally as well. So again, Jeff Bezos is an outlier in this regard. And then when it comes to non-marital childbearing, you know, having kids outside of wedlock, some of you may remember that there was a pretty big to-do back in the early 1990s about a television character named Murphy Brown, this woman who was a kind of a well-educated, professional, affluent lady having a child on her own. Well, in the real world, Murphy, Bound, sorry, Murphy Browns are comparatively rare. So what this is showing us is that the vast majority of kids who are being born to more educated and affluent households are being born to women who are married. And sort of the dramatic growth in non-real childbearing has been really focused much more among working class and poor Americans um, in recent years. Now for me, kind of all these trends are important because they impact our nation's children. Okay? So this class divide that we're talking about tonight, tonight is in particularly important in my estimation because what it leads to is a situation like the one here. This is a, a figure from Robert Putnam's most recent book on kids. Putnam is a professor of political science at Harvard. And what it shows us here is that kids are being raised in um, less educated homes, homes headed by high school educated uh, parent are much more likely to be raised today um, in a single parent home, whereas kids with college educated parents are still today uh, being raised in two parent homes. And if you look carefully at this particular site, you can kind of see that the blue line begins to bend downwards in around 2000. Okay? So, what this is telling us is that I think a lot of college educated Americans kind of began to realize, you know, in the late 80s, 1990s, that kind of their dalliance, if you will, with the divorce revolution, um, with sort of experimenting with alternative lifestyles when it comes to the family, wasn't particularly prudent or wise, or in some cases even principled. And so again, what's interesting here is that I think we've seen that college-educated, more affluent Americans have in many cases become much more marriage-minded, and I'll come back to that, you know, in a few minutes. So the bottom line here is that when I'm thinking about kind of the demographic story is that the United States is devolving, not evolving, it's devolving into a separate and an equal family regime where the highly educated and the affluent enjoy strong and stable families basically and everyone else is consigned to increasingly unstable, unhappy and unworkable ones. That's sort of the, the trajectory that we're on right now. It's obviously it's a sobering one for us as a country. Now, I wanted to, before I kind of move on to sort of the next section, I wanted to also just kind of give you an example of what it is that I'm talking about, kind of in a more Colorado context, right? So, in other words, if we're kind of thinking about this in a more kind of geographic way, 
what I think the data would sort of suggest to us is that marriage is doing pretty well in places like Cherry Hills in Colorado, but it's more likely to be floundering in places like Pueblo here in Colorado. And this figure up on the screen is kind of giving you um, a visual portrait of um, family structure in Colorado. So the darker counties are ones where there are more single parent families. The lighter ones are ones where there are more two parent families heading up uh, those households and those communities. So there's a marriage divide in America. Of course, one of the logical questions here is why? Sort of what, what is driving this growing class divide in American family? It's important for us to recognize, to understand, to acknowledge that there were not large class divides in American families 55 years ago, okay? Upper class, middle class, lower class families were dominated by married, intact families. There wasn't a huge racial divide wasn't a huge ethnic divide. White families, black families, Hispanic families were dominated by intact married families as little as 55 years ago, okay? So it's a pretty striking, you can kind of think about that because it's not that way anymore, right? We've changed a lot in ways that are often, I think, quite negative since then when it comes at least to sort of family structure for our kids. So what accounts for this growing marriage divide in America? Um, and liberals will tend to stress the importance of economic arguments. People like William Julius Wilson at Harvard in his book, When Work Disappears. Conservatives would tend to stress cultural and public policy arguments. Obviously, people like Charles Murray in his book, Coming Apart, um, his book, Losing Ground. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that I think actually on this particular question, um, they're both right. They both have something to tell us tonight about sort of what's happened to our families and why we are seeing this big class divide um, separating us you know, on the marriage front. So I'm gonna talk about sort of changes in the culture. I'm gonna talk about shifts in, uh, shifts in the economy. But I'm also gonna talk too about what's happening in our, in our communities and what's happening on the public policy front as well. I think all four of these factors um, are implicated in this growing uh, marriage divide. But first, let's kind of talk about arguably in some ways the most important thing, and that is the culture. And when you kind of talk about marriage, it's important to acknowledge, to recognize that the vast majority of Americans think that marriage is a good institution, they would like to be married, um, you know, it's still kind of part of people's sort of sense of the American dream, their aspiration for both themselves and for their kids. So. You know, and that's true, again, across, across class lines and across racial lines. But the, I think that the challenge here from a cultural perspective is that Americans have also become much more tolerant, more accepting, more accommodating towards a variety of behaviors and norms that make it much harder to forge a strong and stable marriage. Okay, so in other words, you know, we want sort of in the abstract this thing, you know, a good and happy marriage, right? But we often are not kind of willing to sort of embrace the norms and behaviors that would allow us to sort of realize this aspiration, you know, at a mass level. And sort of just to kind of make this concrete, like I would love to have a 32 inch waist, okay? I had a 32 inch waist when I was 22, okay? But I also really enjoy an iced, vanilla latte in the morning, okay? And so my interest in sort of having a 32 inch waist is in tension with some of my eating and drinking routines, right? So the point I'm making here simply is to sort of say that there's a tension between some of our ideals as Americans on the marriage front and some of our norms and behaviors too that can stand in tension with that. What's interesting here is that this sort of cultural dynamic is definitely stratified by class here in the US. So what we're seeing here is that I think in some important respects, Upper middle class Americans have kind of rediscovered a lot of the values and virtues on the family front that enable them to have these stable married families, more so than many of their working class and poor fellow citizens. So first, kind of thinking about the upper middle class, I think it's important to sort of just touch on this issue of divorce, for instance. And what's striking is that there's been, I think, a shift in attitudes towards divorce. I think in the 70s, 
and 80s, a lot of folks across you know, um, class lines were embracing a more contingent approach to marital commitment, much more like the sort of things that divorce was okay, if that would leave you more fulfilled, for instance, more satisfied with your life. But today, there's been a shift away from that, and not just among conservatives, but even among progressives. And this kind of was illustrated in a story in the New York Times that was entitled called How Divorce Lost Its Groove. And this story profiled women in places like Park Slope, Brooklyn, um, and in Seattle. And of course, if you know anything about these two places, these are very progressive um, communities. And even in these communities, what we're hearing is stories from women talking about how divorce has kind of gone out of fashion among you know, their peers um, and you know, the families that they've, that they've encountered. And in kind of explaining this, one Seattle writer said sort of this. She said, what happened? I'm talking about the sort of shift in attitudes towards marital stability and away from divorce. She said, you know, in the 1970s, the feminists, the hippies, the protesters, the cultural elite all said it's okay to drop out of marriage. In contrast, we, talking about herself and her peers, and she's not a conservative, we made up our minds that we'd put our families first and ourselves second. We'd be good all the time. We would stay married no matter what and drink organic milk, okay? <laughs> so you kind of can see the thinking, right? That she's sort of realizing that in terms of like the healthy lifestyle here for herself and her kids is not just organic milk, it's also putting your family first when it comes to marital stability. That was clearly kind of part of her, her mindset and it was different from what she saw among many of the boomers, you know, back in the 1970s growing up. So again, this is kind of an, an illustration of this kind of shift in thinking. And we see when it comes to sort of attitudinal data that college-educated Americans on the right from the 70s to the 2000s became more likely to endorse restrictive attitudes towards divorce, even while least educated Americans, people with high school, sorry, without high school degrees became um, more permissive in their attitudes towards divorce. It's kind of one example of this dynamic playing out. But I also kind of want to mention too this issue of kind of pregnancy um, to sort of also kind of show you, I think, how this sort of cultural divide is kind of opened up between more educated and affluent Americans and working class and poor Americans in our country. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about this slide by also just mentioning kind of what I see happening in my, in my class. So I teach a big sociology of family class at UVA, got about 180 students in that class. Uh, and they're kind of middle of the road UVA students in terms of their, their politics. They're just kind of like, you know, average Virginia, you know, students. Um, and What's striking about them is that when I ask them a question, you know, do you, are you sort of morally opposed to a woman having a child outside of marriage, a clear majority of them say, no, we're not opposed to that. You know, we are accepting, we're tolerant, et cetera. And then in the very next slide, I ask them, and I have these things called clickers, you may have them here at, at CCU, where you kind of, I can pull them in class anonymously, which is great, so they can kind of tell what they really think. Um, in these polls that we do in class. So I then ask them, would your parents freak out if you came home over Thanksgiving dinner and told them that you were pregnant or that your girlfriend was pregnant? Like 90% of them say yes, their parents would freak out if they came back with this information, right? So the idea here is that even though it's kind of like a public norm that they would embrace of acceptance of inclusivity towards a variety of family forms and you know, a variety of kind of pathways into family formation kind of in the abstract, kind of in their global public ethic. When it comes to kind of their private reality and what their parents expect, much more traditional attitude towards childbearing, okay? And so this is kind of reflected in this slide. What we see here is that kids who are coming from highly educated homes where mom has a college degree are more likely to report that their parents and they, I'm sorry, they would be embarrassed um, by a pregnancy. Whereas kids from more working class um, and poor homes or less educated homes in the middle and the left of these slides are less likely to say that they would be embarrassed by a teen pregnancy. So it kind of just illustrates how, again, in the abstract, Americans across the class spectrum are in favor of marriage. 
when you start to look at specific norms, specific behaviors, um, specific orientations about things like you know, this, this outcome, there are class differences which have obvious implications for um, their ability to form, uh, to forge strong and stable marriages. So again, in terms of the cultural front, what I'm saying is just part of the story here is that we have a culture now where the upper middle class has kind of embraced bourgeois norms and behaviors, you know, adapted for the 21st century that allow them to um, enjoy strong and civil marriages. But those same norms and virtues um, are not necessarily always um, endorsed or embraced by working class and poor Americans. But the story here that I'm telling is not just a cultural one. It's also an economic and a civic story. And when you look at both the economy and you look at our civic institutions, our communities, um, what you see is that many of the institutions that once um, kind of anchored our families when it comes to things like money, comes to things like moral direction, when it comes to things like giving support and counsel to couples and families, um, these institutions become weaker more marginalized in the lives of many working class and poor Americans, in some ways particularly working class and poor men. Um, so what is it that I'm talking about here? So on, on the economic front, what I'm talking about here is that our economy has changed in ways that have made it more difficult for men who don't have college degrees to find decent paying, stable jobs. And that's important um, because even in 2019, it's still the case that women are much more likely to marry a guy who has a decent job. And even in 2019, women are much less likely to divorce a guy who is stably employed. By contrast, when you look at you know, like unemployment among women, for instance, it's not really a big predictor of divorce. Um, but it is still for, uh, you know, for, for men when they're not stably employed. So what I'm suggesting here is that sort of shifts in the economy have eroded the economic position of working class and poor men in ways that have made them less attractive as husbands, make them more vulnerable to getting divorced um, when things go south on the job front. And as this next slide here indicates, things often go south on the job front for men in America who don't have college degrees. You can see here that spells of unemployment in the 2000s become much more common for less educated men than they are for college educated men, okay? So again, what I'm saying is this, the economy out there is changing in ways that impact men without college degrees um, much more powerfully um, than men who are better educated and who also tend to you know, make more money. And this is one reason why we're seeing this class divide open up in American family life. In other words, part of the story here is, is economic, it's not just cultural. I mentioned Robert Putnam just a, uh, a few minutes ago, and he's a professor of political science at Harvard. He's written a book called Bowling Alone as well. And this, and this book sort of chronicles the way in which you know, many of our civic institutions, uh, many of our community institutions have kind of lost um, power, lost authority, um, lost their vitality, you know, from the, the VFW to, you know, the Knights of Columbus to, you know, any number of other institutions. He also, of course, in sort of chronicling this story, talks about the shifting character of American religious life. Um, the ways in which not only we've kind of seen a decline in many sort of local secular institutions, we've also seen a kind of a decline in um, religious life to an important extent um, in America. But when he wrote this book, he didn't really talk about this issue of class. That was not really part of his story in Bowling Alone. But when I looked at the data, I was really struck. This is the thing that kind of most surprised me in all this work I've been doing on this class divide in American life. I was struck by this fact, that in the 1970s, kind of working class Americans, Americans with a high school degree, uh, but not a college degree, um, in yellow in this slide, were the most likely to attend church services. I was kind of thinking of those Reagan Democrats you know, who voted for Ronald Reagan back in 1980. You know, many of them working class Americans connected to a religious community 
of one sort or another, depending upon where they lived. But today, what we see is that college-educated Americans are actually more likely to be found in a church on any given Sunday um, than their working-class peers. This is the thing that most surprised me. You know? And so this obviously is consequential because churches have given a lot of support practically, financially, morally, spiritually um, to couples you know, and to families. And they've kind of reinforced the importance of getting married and the importance of staying married when the going gets tough, you know, as it does, for, of course, for most couples. So anyways, the point is, is that we live in a more secular society, practically speaking. Um, and this secularization has, surprisingly to me at least, kind of affected working class and poor Americans you know, um, in some very real ways more than it has their more educated and affluent peers. And the final point, the fourth point, is the point about public policy. And when it comes to sort of public policy, one of the things that we're sort of seeing play out um, in recent decades is that we've kind of been expanding a lot of policies sort of targeting lower income families. So we've been kind of expanding their income tax credit. We've been expanding Medicaid. Um, we've been expanding child care subsidies. Um, we've been expanding a lot of different things that are designed to help um, not just now poor families, but working class families. And one of the unintended consequences though, of this effort to provide more financial assistance to families, not just sort of in the lowest quintile, but really even in the sort of the second quintile, ended up unintentionally penalizing marriage for many working class families, actually not poor families, because their incomes are so low that they're not affected by these thresholds. So what I'm talking about is sort of, I'll get, kind of give you an example. Um, I was speaking with a couple in, in, in Virginia about three weeks ago, and the father in this couple, I've got two beautiful toe-headed girls, one's about four, one's about six, is an IT guy. And probably, I would guess he makes maybe like, I don't know, $30,000 a year. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and I was just kind of like asking them about their relationship, their family life, and you know, they seem like a married couple with kids. But it became pretty apparent that no, they weren't married, they were cohabiting. Um, as I was talking to him a bit more about this, and I'm just kind of like trying to sort of probe why they weren't married. And it kind of came out, it'd be too expensive for them to get married. And I was thinking maybe they're thinking about like having an over the top wedding. And no, that wasn't it. They actually sat down in their kitchen table with a calculator and just kind of and, and looked at sort of the regulations for Medicaid in Virginia and realized that if they got married with his income, they'd lose access to health care insurance for their two daughters. And so that was the reason they hadn't gotten married. So this is a kind of a concrete example of the way in which we have these kind of thresholds. And if your income falls below these thresholds for a lot of these programs, you get access to the program. If it's above, you don't get access to the program. And so when you can combine the income of the two parents, you know, married and then report that income, you can lose access to these, these policies and programs. And for them, and they have a pretty modest budget, you know, paying for healthcare insurance um, as a married couple um, would take a substantial bite out of their monthly budget. And they thought they really can afford to get married and lose healthcare insurance for their two, uh, for their two daughters. So again, the final point here, somebody said there are public policies <clears throat> we have now in the books that have ended up um, undercutting, uh, particularly today, working class uh, families um, and their sort of their capacity to sort of, in a sense, to afford uh, marriage for themselves, um, in this case, for their children. So kind of when you think about adding all this stuff up, what I'm suggesting today is that there, there's a kind of a, a way in which the sort of the retreat from marriage among working class and poor Americans is overdetermined. There are cultural, economic, civic, and policy factors that have all kind of worked together to um, reduce the strength of marriage among working class and poor Americans. And at the same time, for our upper middle class, who often kind of talks left, Recall that my students at UVA kind of would embrace, in theory, the idea of having a child outside of wedlock, you know, for in general. But when it comes to kind of themselves, 
you know, and sort of their own parents' mentality. No, 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 that was that's not, not on order. So for themselves, they're putting marriage before the baby carriage. They're rejecting easy divorce. Um, most of their family is actually headed by a male breadwinner. And they're also the most sort of religiously and civically engaged members of their communities as well. Okay. So in some important respects, they're kind of living a very traditional lifestyle, um, even in, in 2019. And you know, both the adults and the kids in this milieu are benefiting from you know, having stable marriages in their lives. So I just made the point that I think that there are some benefits when it comes to family stability. So let's talk about that now for, for a few minutes. So again, why does it matter that there's a marriage divide in America? What's kind of the big deal? You know, aren't families becoming just more diverse today in 2019? Well, you know, it's a big deal actually because in part kids are more likely to flourish when they're raised in intact married families compared to the alternative. Um, now, I'm sort of saying this to you as someone who was raised by a single mother, I think my mom did a pretty good job with me and with my sister. We're both actually happily married. We've got a lot of kids between the two of us. You've been, you know, I think probably, this, I don't know, about 35 years of marriage between the two of us. So, you know, we're, we're kind of doing fine. But as a sociologist, it's important to acknowledge, to recognize that family instability is a risk factor for kids on a variety of fronts. And these next couple of slides give you a sense of some of those risks um, for kids. So when it comes to economics, for instance, we know that kids who are being raised in single mother households, single father households, in the center on the right of this slide, are much more likely to experience poverty um, than people, sorry, than kids being raised um, in married families. So again, there's kind of an economic story here. When it comes to incarceration, we can see here is that boys who don't have a father in the household are much more likely to sort of succumb to the call of the street, to fall in with boys who don't, you know, have the best relationship with the law. So again, if you're being raised by a single mother, you're about twice as likely to end up in prison or in jail, at least at one point in your life, before you turn 30, compared to boys who are being raised in an intact married household with their dads um, in the picture. And this story here is controlling for a lot of things, including parental education, income, race, and ethnicity. But sort of dads matter, family structure matters for daughters as well. What we can see here is that girls who are being raised without their dads in the picture are more likely to become pregnant as a teenager to, again, not to have his attention, not to have him sort of monitoring the boys in their milieu. Um, most importantly, not to sort of, you know, getting his affection. Um, a, a colleague of mine sort of looked at a lot of these factors and he found that when he controlled for kind of the quality of the relationship between the father and the daughter, that was really the best predictor of teenage pregnancy for girls here in America. So again, these are kind of just some of the factors that help to explain a PowerPoint slide like the one up here. And then when it comes to school, obviously school is the is a, you know important part of getting the human capital that you need to sort of thrive in this competitive economy we have here in 21st century America. But it's hard to get the schooling that you need if you're getting into trouble at school. And what this work by my colleague Nicholas Zill suggests to us is that kids who are in non-intact families are much more likely to be getting into trouble at school. They have their parents contacted by you know a principal or a vice principal <clears throat> or a teacher. And so we can see here again that, um, that family structure is linked to some important outcomes for kids and that kids in a variety of non-intact families are more likely to be running into trouble um, on the school front. And as they kind of move towards college, you can see here um, that kids from both more privileged homes on the right and kids from less privileged homes on the left are more likely to graduate from college if they've got um, an intact family sort of standing behind them and helping to pay for tuition, but also kind of giving them emotional support um, both kind of before and after um, they've entered college as well. And then finally, in terms of just kind of the child outcomes, we can see that the patterns of mobility are different for kids from intact families versus um, divorced families. And so what you can see here basically is that 
if you're coming from you know, a continuously married family on the left, and you're coming from the bottom the third of income distribution here, I'll just jump down to show this to you more clearly. So let's say you basically you're growing up poor here, okay, and your parents are stably married. Um, you've got a 50% shot of making it to the middle or the upper class, you know, as an adult. By contrast, if you're coming, you know, from the poorest homes um, and your parents get divorced, you've only a, basically a 26% shot of making it into the middle class or the upper class. And this story also plays actually for rich kids as well. So there was an article written by Matthew Iglesias, who was a, at that point a columnist for Slate, uh, talking about David Brooks' divorce. Unfortunately, David Brooks got divorced. Um, but he was sort of just kind of making some snide comments about this because Brooks had written about the importance of family stability for America. And what he said was, well, Brooks' you know, kids will be just fine because you know, Brooks is a rich and prominent man in American life. And based upon his own experience growing up in Manhattan, there are plenty of kids who grew up in kind of rich, unstable family homes who kind of turned out fine. Now, of course, what's interesting about this is that normally, Iglesias actually relies upon you know, stats and numbers to sort of make his arguments. But in this particular article for Slate, there were no numbers. It was just all anecdotal from his you know, perspective. But if you look carefully at these two columns here and here, uh, you can see that Iglesias was wrong. Because what this is showing us is that even rich kids um, are affected, it looks like, by the family stability that they're um, experiencing. So what this is showing us, basically, is that a clear majority of kids who are raised in intact, married, wealthy families are wealthy as adults, right here. Whereas only 37% of them are wealthy as adults if um, they grew up rich, but their parents got divorced. So my point here simply is that there's a link between kind of family stability here and where kids end up um, economically and financially as adults, you know, kind of later on in life. Or the bottom line is that kids who are raised in intact married homes are significantly more likely to realize the American dream, um, economically at least, and to steer clear of poverty. Now, if this was, I don't know, 1992, we could kind of just stop here. But I want to talk a little bit about cohabitation before wrapping this up. Um, and what I want to just sort of note here about cohabitation is that it used to be the case when I was studying family sociology at Princeton in the 1990s that sort of my biggest concern was about divorce and unwed childbearing, single motherhood especially. But today, what's happening is that more kids are going to be experiencing a cohabiting household then they're going to experience divorce. Okay? Actually, one piece of good news in all this is that divorce has actually come down a lot since 1980. Um, and so that, what that means is kids who are born today to married families are in the main likely to remain with both their married parents. But a lot of kids are being born in cohabiting unions. And then for those kids who are experiencing divorce, um, you know, their parents will often cohabit with another partner after uh, their marriage ends. So what that means is that about 40% of our kids in this country um, are experiencing cohabitation. So it's a new family form. And the question is sort of how does this affect our kids? And you know, you, you might imagine that you've got two adults in the household, so maybe the outcomes are better than the outcomes for kids in single parent households. But on many outcomes, that's not the case. When it comes to things like drug use, in this case smoking pot, when it comes to dropping out of high school, when it comes to things like depression, it looks like the outcomes for kids in cohabiting families are pretty similar to outcomes for kids in single parent families. And on one outcome, the outcomes are markedly worse for kids in cohabiting families. So when you look at child abuse and neglect, what you see here is that um, kids who are in these households right here here and here are about nine times more likely to be physically, emotionally, and sexually abused 
compared to kids in intact married biological families. And this middle category here on the screen are households where you've got a cohabiting parent um, with an unrelated adult. It's usually a, a biological mother and an unrelated adult male. So these are kind of the most dangerous places for kids um, in America when it comes to sort of this issue of, again, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, and emotional abuse. So you know, what is it about cohabitation that's kind of risky for kids? Again, you have two adults. What's, what's the sort of, what's the story here? Well, the story, I think, is that cohabitation is attractive to adults because it seems to offer freedom and flexibility. Easy entry, easy exit, right? Well, from a kid's perspective, that's not a, that's not a particularly attractive <laughs> scenario. Right? If you've got these two adults in your household, maybe if they're the biological parents or maybe even you know, mom and a boyfriend, that kind of lack of, you know, of stability may not be so appealing. So what you have you know, practically is less commitment, typically, less trust, typically, more sexual infidelity, more violence, and less parental supportiveness from cohabiting parents compared to married parents. And you have a lot more family instability as a consequence. And, you know, and if you've been a babysitter for young children, if you've been a teacher of young children, if you've been a parent of young children, you can appreciate that kids thrive on stable routines with stable caregivers. And that's not what cohabitation tends to deliver um, for, for kids. So this next slide here gives you um, that story. You can see here that kids who are born to cohabiting parents are much more likely to see their parents break up by age five um, compared to kids who are born to, uh, to married parents. So kind of to wrap up this, this perspective on sort of the impact of family structure on children, I want to just kind of give you a quote from Sarah McClanahan, my mentor at Princeton University, um, professor of sociology at Princeton, and her colleague Gary Sandiford, at the University of Wisconsin. And after doing, you know, literally dozens of studies, um, analyzing thousands of kids across the U.S., um, these two scholars who are not conservative people, you know, came to this conclusion. Is if they were to design a family that is just kind of like, just based upon their research, just kind of, you know, blank slate, let's just sort of think about what might work, you know, for a family. This is what they would do. They said, two-parent ideal, they would ensure that children had access to the time and money of two adults, provide a system of checks and balances that promote equality parenting, you know, with both parents sort of supporting one another, monitoring one another, you know, as they're parenting their children. And the fact that both parents have a biological connection to the child would increase the likelihood that the parents would identify with the child and be willing to sacrifice for the child. And it would reduce the likelihood that either parent would abuse the child. Okay? So again, kind of coming at this from a perspective shaped really by their own empirical research, studying how lots of different family forms had affected kids, this was their model basically, sort of the intact two-parent biological family was kind of what they thought was, you know, the ideal for, uh, for kids. And the final thing that I want to say just before I conclude is that <clears throat> I've been explaining, I think, why <clears throat> marriage and why intact families matter for individual kids in a sense. We also think we have to recognize how what's happening in our families matters for our communities and for our country. There's a sort of idea, I think, in American life that sort of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? That sort of what happens in our, our own worlds, our own families, sort of stays in our own world, stays in our own families. It's a private thing, you know? Leave me alone, you know? I can do what I want to do. Well, when it comes to at least family life, that doesn't, really kind of, doesn't really fit the empirical reality. Because when you look at things like the dramatic increase in child poverty, for instance, from the 70s to the 1990s, you know, as more and more people kind of elected to, to sort of to do their own thing when it came to sort of marriage and family life, um, you know, their kids would often pay a financial price for that. And their communities would pay a, a price financially for that. And the country paid a price financially as well, as we saw a dramatic increase in child poverty because of shifts in family structure here in America. Or 
consider income inequality you know, a major issue uh, for the left especially today. And what we're seeing is that you know, families in sort of the yellow and the red portion of this figure down here, um, you know, in the upper and, and upper, upper strata, you know, are doing better um, relative to working class and poor Americans especially. And a good portion of that story is related to shifts in the economy that I talked about just a few minutes ago. But it's also the case too that the changing character of American families is also driving income inequality. And so Bruce Western, for instance, who has been at Harvard, is now at Columbia, has written about the way in which the increasing share of single parent families among working class and poor Americans is basically reducing their access to income and assets in ways that are fueling economic inequality um, in America. So again, part of the story here is not just about shifts in the economy, it's also about shifts in our families that are leading to more economic inequality in American society. And then finally, in terms of just the community story here tonight, I could, in, in the q and I'm happy to talk about other community effects of all this, but it's also think, important to recognize that the health of the American dream is directly connected to the health of families in communities across the US. And this scatter plot is kind of showing this, you know, um, with um, a different X and Y axis trend. Now, before I kind of, kind of jump into this, the scatter plot, I want to kind of just ask you, like, if you think about the major metropolitan areas in America, where do you think poor kids have the greatest shot at realizing the American dream economically that is going from the bottom 20th you know, percentile to the top 20th percentile as adults. So it's going from rags to riches, growing up poor, becoming rich. In which major metropolitan area do you think kids are most likely to do this in the US? Salt Lake City, yes. And I have a little <laughs> picture here of Salt Lake here up on the, up on the screen. So this research done by Raj Chetty, who's at Harvard in economics, is looking again at all this, this kind of stuff ecologically, environmentally. And what he's showing us in his work is that both actually at the neighborhood level and at the metropolitan area level, that kids who are growing up in communities with more two-parent families, who are growing up poor, are much more likely to be doing well financially as adults. So there's something about having lots of neighbors those stable two-parent families that seems to benefit kids who are growing up poor, whether or not their parents are together or in a single-parent household. And his research indicates that family structure is one of the strongest correlates of upward mobility um, in communities across America. And I've actually looked at his, he's got some new data on neighborhoods and I find, once again, when you kind of look at a more um, <clears throat> granular measure of kind of the, the community environment, that it's also the case, too, again, that family structure is one of the best predictors of upper mobility for poor kids um, in neighborhoods across the US. So to kind of put this all together, the bottom line here, from an ecological or environmental or communal or country perspective, is, is that if you care about poverty, if you care about in income inequality, um, if you care about kind of the health of the American dream, you should be also concerned about the health um, of American families. So where do we go from here? And as I conclude, I want to just, I want to make a point, I think about the way in which conservatives need to be rethinking our approach to these kinds of issues tonight. Because I think for a long time, conservatives have rightly appreciated, have understood the social fact that strong and stable families are a precondition for a prosperous economy and for a limited government. That's, that's definitely true. But I don't think that conservatives have sufficiently appreciated or understood the ways in which strong and stable families depend upon widely distributed prosperity and upon the right kinds of laws and public policies. So what I'm saying is that there's a reciprocal relationship between strong families here on the one hand and the right kind of economy 
and public policies on the other hand. And conservatives have understood how kind of the family helps the economy and even helps kind of limit the size and scope of government. And, and they're right about that. But I don't think they've really appreciated how much what's happening over here, you know, affects the family. So my point is, as we kind of think about going forward today in the 21st century, um, I think we need to recognize that sort of talking about marriage, talking about family life, talking about personal responsibility is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Necessary, but not sufficient. We also need to do is to start thinking about all these issues from a more structural perspective. I'm not saying from a left-wing perspective, from a more structural perspective, recognizing that we're embedded in communities, we're embedded in a marketplace that's dynamic and changing um, in ways that are often quite good, but also today often quite bad. And so in light of that kind of insight, sort of the importance of sort of attending to the structures that are affecting particularly poor working class families in America, we need to be thinking about ways to change the economic world, um, the policy world, the, the religious world, um, and the cultural world in ways that be more conducive to strong and stable families um, for poor working class Americans. So what I'm talking about concretely is that when it comes to the economy, for instance, to be thinking about you know, public policies that would make vocational training and apprenticeship education more accessible to many of our younger adults, especially our younger men, who are often ill-served by our current approach to education, which tends to sort of focus a lot more on college. Um, and that would have implications for their ability to go on and get a decent job and to marry successfully. It means thinking about um, ending the marriage penalty in our means-tested programs and policies. We've done a lot of that when it comes to our taxes facing middle and upper income Americans, but we haven't really tackled this marriage penalty for working class and poor Americans, and that's a big oversight. On the religious front, it means thinking a lot more about how our churches and our parachurch institutions are serving people who are not educated and affluent. So when it comes to, I'm Catholic for instance, there's a great group called Focus based here in Colorado that does great campus ministry work um, on campuses across America. But there's no focus for the millions of young adults who are not on that college track. This is a big oversight. We need to be thinking a lot more in religious communities about how we can be serving our uh, fellow Americans who are not in that more educated and affluent track or bracket. And then culturally, of course, thinking about ways we can, and this is obviously a big challenge, we can kind of, um, change the culture to some extent in Hollywood or Madison Avenue, but also or even kind of create different culture when it comes to things like obviously music and films um, and you know, now things on the internet that help to sort of shape the worldview and the aspirations and dreams and expectations of young adults when it comes to things like you know, sex and parenthood and marriage and family. So it's these kinds of sort of more structural realities I think that need to be part of our thinking and part of our you know, activities if we're gonna do anything to um, you know, turn this story around. And I would say that the alternative to taking steps like these is to accept that our country, that the United States, will continue to devolve into a separate and equal family regime where the highly educated and more affluent enjoy strong and stable families. Everyone else is consigned to increasingly unstable, unhappy, and unworkable ones. None of us, I think, tonight wants such a world. So let's get to the task of making sure that Americans and poor working class communities have just the same shot at forging strong, stable families as we do. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions, so um, make sure before you start speaking, you get the microphone. We've got two students here with microphones because there are people watching online. They can't hear your questions if you don't have the microphone here. So um, if you have a, we'll start with Senator Kevin Lumberg. Uh, we'll get a microphone over to him. Appreciate your words. Uh, you certainly covered a lot of territory in a, in a very short space. In terms of policy, though, you've you've kind of boiled that down to the marriage penalty and. And I'd like to challenge that a little bit and get your reaction to it. I think there are a couple of components of policy that aren't touched on in, in your talk. And, you know, maybe I've missed it, so you can tell me about that. But uh, one is um, 
just in terms of, of public policy for the lowest class, uh, from my opinion, we have created so many programs for people at that level that there's no marriage, in, there's no incentive to stay married because uh, it's it's not just a marriage penalty of if you you know legally tie the knot now you have to say sure. married on the thing, right. but but in fact it's so easy to either not become married or to uh, to get divorced because there are programs that just pick up for 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 the uh, the the mom in particular there are a lot of things to pick up sure. and for the dad there there is you know a lot of advantages as opposed to at the at the upper class levels right. you get divorced and suddenly you know a third or maybe two thirds of your income is now going for alimony issues et cetera et cetera sure. um, that's one policy issue the other policy sure. issue that and I don't know you as a sociologist can't actually measure yet, but in the last, let's say, five to ten years, the very definition of not just marriage but um, gender has shifted so dramatically that I'd suggest that that's a policy failure that is going to explode. Um, Twenty years from now, sociologists, I think, are going to be looking back and saying, you know, when we forgot what a marriage was, uh, everything else crumbled. Yeah, so two good questions. On the first question, I think it's definitely the case that um, a stronger welfare state has made marriage less economically essential than it used to be. Um, and so that's certainly part of, part of the story. I think kind of moving forward, the challenge will be, too, to sort of um, think about policies that kind of are designed to reinforce um, classic American ideals without undercutting the family. So you may, you may know the work of Orrin Cass, for instance, who's at the Manhattan Institute. Um, but he's been talking to about, for instance, some kind of wage subsidy that would sort of reinforce um, the kind of connection to work without penalizing marriage and also without penalizing businesses too, as the minimum wage often can. So, you know, that's, I think, one way to think about creative kind of adjustment to um, the welfare state. But I, I take kind of the, you know, the, the basic logic of your question, you know, to be, you know, on the money. Um, in terms of the second question, you know, I think we are kind of launching a pretty big experiment right now um, with, um, you know, same-sex marriage, and um, I'm not sure how this transgender issue is going to play out with respect to sort of you know, the definition of marriage per se. But it's certainly the case that it's a big experiment, and it could well fail. Um, and I think you're right. We'll probably know in 10 or 20 years whether this new experiment is going to um, make it much more difficult for people to have a sense of who they are and what their families should look like, you know. Um, but, you know, right now, speaking as social scientists, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's an open question about how this is going to play out. Question over here. I noticed on one of your slides um, that children who are adopted are just below kids who are fostered, sure. they're getting the most calls from the um, school about their behavior from, right. uh, from yes. school. Right. Yeah, could you expound on that and sure. maybe explain a little bit? So my colleagues and I at the Institute for Family Studies have kind of looked um, in more detail at kind of the adoption story. Um, you know, for a long time when I was reading studies about this question, they would sort of say things like, you know, well, kids in intact, you know, married biological adoptive families do this way and kids and other families do that way. Um, and, but as we kind of begin to sort of break out those categories and sort of measure outcomes differently for, you know, um, for kids who are from adoptive homes, we saw that it, on many sort of social, emotional, and educational outcomes, kids who were adopted were more likely to struggle. Um, and I think, and this is actually, even though they're more likely to be raised by married well-educated, more affluent parents, you know, as well. So it's kind of what we call the adoption paradox. And how do you explain the adoption paradox? Well, I think you explain it a couple of ways. One is they're more likely to have experienced trauma in early life. Um, two is they're more likely not to have, you know, established a kind of proper attachment, you know, with, you know, with their biological parents or their adoptive parents early on in life. Um, and, you know, the third factor might be that, um, I think too that for adoptive kids in adolescence and in adulthood, there can be some real questions around their uh, 
their own identity, you know, and, and their roots, their origins, um, and you know, kind of an inability to kind of know their biological parents, to know their kin, in some cases even to kind of know kind of what their ethnicity is. In terms of like, you know, where are my, you know, my ancestors from? They don't necessarily know that. So, um, although of course now with the new testing, you kind of figure that one out. But anyway, so I think there's some questions about identity that can kind of loom pretty large for adoptive children as well. So these are some of the reasons I think why they're more likely to struggle. And it also kind of reminds me too of Sarah McClanahan and Gary Sanifer's you know, comment about if they were kind of designing an ideal family, they'd be designing one where both parents were the biological parents of the children. And you know, I think we don't necessarily appreciate that reality you know, in our culture today, but there's something about the sort of biological kinship that you know, the anthropologists would tell you kind of matters. Um, and I think you know, adoption is probably one example of the way in which kids who don't have that connection with their parents are, are just more likely to struggle. Over here, Dr. Newell. I really appreciate your uh, study and your results and your conclusions. I think it's heartening to hear this, to see it, to share it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would build on uh, Senator Lundberg's comments. When you look at the incentives and disincentives that can be brought to bear that can make a difference, as I look at this list right here, I'm reminded of the importance of vocational training. Right. Not everybody needs to get two or three degrees, right. and they can provide very well for their family and be a, a breadwinner. And I think, I'm hoping increasingly that will happen yeah, as, a, as a policy, public policy. The second thing is this, and, and I know you can only uh, glean so much either from the literature or from designing a study, but I'd be very interested in knowing <clears throat> the difference in um, uh, prenuptial agreements in the lower classes that you're referring to here, lower economic classes, I would think that would be a very rare kind of a consideration. In the upper echelon of economy, of the, of the economic scale, I would think it would be far more likely. Now, whether it would make a difference or not, but it certainly creates a level of disincentive for divorce, whether it's the woman being the breadwinner winner, or, the, or, the, or the man. And I just think it would be interesting to know how that plays out in these kind of considerations. So on the, on the first question, I think, um, I think Anna and I'm more hopeful that there actually has been a lot of bipartisan interest on vocational education, um, on doing more programmatically and shifting some of our higher education funding towards, um, although you might not, <laughs> I like that, you know, away from sort of the, you know, the four-year colleges and more towards um, programs that are providing vocational um, skills to young adults. Um, I think it's also, we still have to kind of push that mentality into our, our, our schools serving, you know, um, high school students, you know, middle school <coughs> students. And it hasn't yet, I don't think, penetrated enough in many of our school districts that we can be doing a lot more when it comes to IT, when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to healthcare to prepare our kids for these great vocational tracks, they can earn decent incomes and you know really support a family um, by pursuing these vocational tracks. Um, but I do think there's there's movement that's positive in that direction. On the prenup um, point, um, I think it is definitely true that they're more common among probably the most affluent Americans. But they're still comparatively rare. Um, and um, my my sense on the prenup story is that. Um, you know, anything that's sort of kind of, in, it's designed to kind of anticipate the possibility of divorce actually increases your risk of divorce, right? So if you're kind of planning for, well, you know, if this thing doesn't quite work out, I've got this prenup that's going to cover that scenario. I think if you have that approach, that mentality, you're more likely to kind of end up divorced because you haven't fully given yourself over to your spouse. You haven't fully given yourself over to the marriage. You haven't fully created you know, um, that unity um, in your relationship, including financial unity, that's more likely to, you know, promote marriage. The only piece of evidence they have on this particular score is, that, and this is actually more relevant for many people here probably today, including young adults today, because it's more and more common with young adults today, is that a lot of newly married couples now are keeping their checking accounts separate. My money, your money, you know, mi casa, tu casa. You know. 
And, um, but it turns out if that's your approach to money, you're more likely to end up in divorce court. You know? So again, like when you have this commitment to really kind of living that spirit of unity in the marriage to its fullest, including financially, you know, you're more likely to, um, to remain stably married. So I, on the prenup thing, I would guess that folks are, who are getting prenups probably more likely compared to similar couples to end up divorced. Another question? Yes, sir, right here. So, um, just sort of following up on the question over here about adoption, yeah. um, just wondering what the differences and outcomes that you see between adopted kids and kids from single mothers, and um, kind of thinking of it in terms of the context of just having seen Unplanned um, this past right. weekend and, right. and thinking about public policy ramifications of, of encouraging or discouraging abortion, but then what do you do with the kids and the mothers that have had the, that have foregone the abortion? Right, so I think in terms of kind of comparison, I'm sorry, comparing single parents and adoptive parents, um, you know, I, I would like to see, on the adoptive front, I'd like to sort of see, we don't necessarily know enough about kind of their parents. Um, so it would be, it would be, just speaking as a scholar, it'd be nice to sort of have a sort of more information about kind of the parents um, to kind of do a better job of sort of what's the, you know, um, the other scenario here for these children. So even though on some outcomes, kids from single parent families do better than kids from adoptive households, um, it could be that the, you know, that sort of in toto, you know, the single mothers in, in that single parent group um, are in kind of in, in better shape um, than many of the, the parents put their kids up for adoption. So it's not a kind of a perfect comparison there um, from a methodological perspective. Now in terms of just the issue of abortion, um, I would just, you know, say that um, I think even if kids aren't, you know, going to Harvard or if kids are, you know, are honestly sort of struggling in school more or, you know, if they're more likely to have some other kinds of, you know, difficulties and challenges, um, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be born, you know. So, no, but, you know, that's, I think, but I, sort of the practical takeaway here, I think, is that um, we should be thinking about particularly ways um, as friends and neighbors, as churches, as communities to sort of walk alongside of adoptive parents, um, to recognize that Adoption is a beautiful thing, it's a great thing, but it's also, in many cases, a very difficult thing. And so, you know, um, I think it means, you know, practically, um, like, making more of an effort to, if you, you know, have your kids invite the adopted kid over for, you know, a play date or for a sleepover. Um, maybe it means, you know, volunteering to babysit for, um, adoptive parents, be more intentional about those kinds of things to give both the kids and the parents some extra support. Um, and this is true, I think, also for you know, single parents. We kind of make the same argument you know, for single parents, too. I mean, to recognize it's a challenge to be a single parent, it's a challenge to be an adoptive parent in ways that I think often go way beyond the reality of parenting um, you know, biological kids in an intact family. Yes, sir, we'll go up here. One more question about single parent families. Is there any difference if a parent is single as a result of death or mm -hmm. divorce? Yeah, it's a great question. And the research um, suggests that on many outcomes, and this is kind of shocking, right? On many outcomes, divorce is worse than death for children. So I'm just sort of saying empirically, if you had to choose for your child, you know, <laughs> the death of a parent versus the, the divorce of their two parents, you would choose the death of the parent. So not true for all outcomes, but it is striking that on some of the outcomes, it looks like divorce is more challenging for kids than, than the loss of the parent. Yeah. Other questions right there in the blue? If I understood what you were saying that that marriage divorce is more on the decline for more affluent. Is that correct? Yep. That are better educated. Mm -hmm. Is there a relationship to the age that they're now marrying? Because what I'm seeing is that they're marrying later, so they're getting through college. They're kind of sowing their oats. They oftentimes cohabitat mm -hmm. in advance, and mm -hmm. so consequently, by the time they make that decision to marry, mm -hmm. 
there's more likelihood that they're going to stay married. I don't know that that's true, but I'm just wondering, sure. is there a correlation that they're waiting right. longer? Yeah, so it looks like right now when it comes to sort of marital stability, the sweet spot is sort of late 20s, basically. Um, well, it's also kind of hard to know. It's also kind of the, the, the modal, what we call the modal pattern. That's like when most people get married is in their late 20s and early 30s now. So it's sort of hard to disentangle. Well, that's just kind of like they're kind of just, they're kind of in the middle of the pack, you know, and that's why they're less, you know, less likely to get divorced. But it could be partly a maturity story as well. Um, but it's also the case, too, when you look at marital quality, that the sweet spot is sort of your mid 20s, okay? So, these are two different outcomes, marital happiness and marital stability. And what's interesting is that you know, the people who get married in their mid-20s are more likely to have the happiest marriages, and those who get married in their, in their late 20s have the most stable marriages. Um, and I think on the, on the stability piece, it's, you know, it's primarily about maturity. Um, and on the marital quality piece, it's primarily about kind of being able to establish a, a sense of we-ness, like we are a couple that we have these traditions, we do these things together. We're sort of establishing our life together as a family and going forward. Um, and so I think that's maybe why that, you know, getting married at a younger age, really speaking, gives them a comparative advantage in the marital quality. Part. So again, there's these two different outcomes um, that we're seeing play out for different um, ages at marriage. I also would say too, that when it comes to marital stability, that couples who are attending church together um, don't, ex don't face the same kinds of risks for divorce in general, but also when it comes to you know, getting married in their mid or early 20s as well. So that sort of age factor is less salient um, for divorce for couples who attend church together and have a community su sort of supporting them as younger married couples. Is there maybe one more question, Janine? Or we'll go to a student afterwards. I, just, I have two questions. One is w the, there's not only so much research about the well-being of children in a married situation is also a lot of research about the well-being of adults. And we didn't talk about that tonight, but my, here's my question. With all this robust, plentiful data, what is going on that we cannot figure out a way in public policy to actually support this institution? Well, I, it's a great question. So, you know, when it comes to things like smoking, when it comes to things like obesity, when it comes to other kinds of issues that have sort of a clear biological and social impact on the population at large, no hesitation to address those kind of um, in public policy contexts and in the public square more generally. I, you know, I, I think obviously with this issue of marriage and family structure, um, there is, you know, there are concerns about um, stigmatizing, marginalizing people, you know, who've gotten divorced, who've had kids out of wedlock, um, and, you know, also there's this commitment now that we have to, um, to tolerance, you know, to acceptance, to diversity, um, and this sort of cultural commitment to these, you know, to these ideals makes us unwilling to make judgments about people's family lives. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, those two dynamics especially that help to explain why we're very hesitant to address these issues in, in a public context. But I think, obviously, we have to do that, and we have to recognize that until we do that, and until we actually, you know, also, though, not just, I'm not talking here about, you know, finger-wagging and moralizing, but basically sort of say, you know, folks, look, if you want to thrive, you know, when you're, you know, when you're, 45, or when you're approaching retirement financially, there is, as you know, a success sequence. And if you get at least an education, like a high school education, you work full time, then you marry, and then you have kids, and you remain stably married, your odds of being poor are very low, about 3%. Your odds of being in the middle class, upper class are quite high. Um, and so, and your kids, obviously, odds of, of flourishing are also. So this is really about trying to sort of translate this message into a more hopeful and positive one about sort of saying, look, one piece of the American dream is related to sort of how you go about forming your own family and sustaining your marriage. Um, and this is, we're not trying to be mean here. We're just trying to kind of like give you some wisdom that a lot of the folks living in, you know, for instance, even in Boulder, <laughs> you know, would privately have taken to heart even if publicly they're not willing to talk about it, you know, in their public schools and 
you know, in Denver and elsewhere. All right, Chad, last one. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, just talking with all the students, we really appreciate uh, your presentation. I just have two brief questions. Uh, would you just be able to expand a little more on the, the Salt Lake City phenomenon with rags to riches? And the second one is, uh, it seems as if the millennial generation and Gen Z, um, we've borne the brunt of the cohabitable household since about 1993. Do you believe there's a chance that our generation will uh, try and reverse uh, the effects since they had gone through it for their children? So on the Salt Lake City here, the story is basically that um, so where a lot of families are headed by single parent families on uh, this scatter plot over here in this slide. This is from Raj Chetty, who's an economist at Harvard University. Their odds of kind of getting up into the, the top 20% of the American economy as, as, as adults are much lower, you know, 5, 10%, you know, by this, by this graph. Whereas kids who are in, in places where there are relatively few single parent families in their communities, and many more two-parent families of odds that are more like 15, 20, 25, 30 percent. And so what this is sort of telling us is that a metropolitan area like um, Salt Lake City, where there are lots of two-parent families, is more likely to give kids who are growing up in poor families the opportunity as you know, um, adults to be affluent, to be rich, to be in that top 20 percent. By contrast, Metropolitan areas like Atlanta and Charlotte that have lots of single parent families are much more likely to lock in poverty for poor kids. So these are metropolitan areas that are like right over here. And so if you grow up poor in a community with lots of single parent families, you're more likely to stay poor as an adult. And so the question of course is, well, why is that? What's the story here? And I think the story here in part is about social supports and social controls. And so when there are lots of two-parent families in your neighborhood, what that means is there's more safety, okay? So you're less likely to fall into some kind of criminal activity or delinquency or gang activity when there are lots of two-parent families, lots of fathers, to be, to be clear here, who are helping to kind of, you know, shape the, the character um, in terms of public safety of the neighborhood. By contrast, lots of single mothers, there's more delinquency, there's more gang activity, there's more crime. And, and kids, particularly boys, are more likely to get on the wrong track, end up in trouble with the law and incarcerated. That's gonna have a big impact on their mobility as adults, obviously, for the boys. Um, and then when it comes to uh, education, another kind of important part of the American dream, um, when you have lots of two-parent families, you've got lots of parents involved with the schools, you know, the PTO, the, you know, the bake sales, you know, all this volunteering we do now in our schools, et cetera. You know, so, that's more likely to happen when you've got lots of two-parent families you know, in, in the school system. Well, lots of single-parent families, the parents are less engaged, less involved in the schools, and that has impact on, on the quality of education. Um, and then, obviously, also work is pretty important in realizing the American dream. And what we're seeing, particularly for men, for boys, is that when you're growing up in a neighborhood without lots of gainfully employed men, you don't have in your head kind of the model that, you know, work is integral to being a good man, you know? And so if there aren't like a lot of, you know, mentors or leads for jobs in your neighborhood, you know, as a young man, you're more likely not to sort of be stably employed. Um, and so there's a neighborhood effect there. By contrast, if you grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, basically all the guys, you know, your neighbors, your friends, your own dad, you know, go to work in the morning, come home, you know, from work in the evening, that's going to be kind of like your template, your model, and that's going to shape how you approach the labor force as well. So it's just some ideas about how these neighborhood effects are playing out when it comes to things like crime, incarceration, education, work. Um, and there's more work on this question, again, from Raj Chetty, who's got a big project with a lot of colleagues thinking about these issues um, at Harvard. Now, on the cohabitation front, you know, it's hard for me to know where that's going to go. Um, but on sort of the family front, and this is maybe a good way to end this discussion, I don't want us to be too pessimistic about where we're headed on the family front. Um, we are seeing actually since the Great Recession, 
a decline in nonmarital childbearing for the first time in decades. Also been seeing a decline in divorce. And it's just simple mathematics, right? If there are fewer kids being born outside of marriage, and if marriage is more stable, that means, I mean, if these trends continue, and of course, I'm not, I don't want to kind of do the prophecy thing with, with sociology, but if these trends continue, that what's just we're going to see, I think, a slight increase in family stability for kids in America going forward, at least for the next couple of years. And I think it's part and parcel of what I call a culture of caution among millennials and among younger adults. And there's some bad parts of this culture of caution. You know, we can talk about that later. But on the positive side of the ledger, I think young adults your age and a little bit older are today um, moving more carefully into marriage and more carefully into parenthood. And at least on the family stability front, that's, that's I think, good news. Great. Come up here real quick, Brad. Let's give uh, Dr. Wilcox another round of applause. Thank you so much for your work up here. Give a little gift for you. All right, we have for you some of our famous 1776 ties oh, and a wonderful scarf wonderful. for your wife okay. there. So Thanks for take that stuff. with you. Okay. Thank you again yeah. very much. Appreciate Thanks, your appreciate time today. Here. Let's give him another round of applause. That was great. You know, we're often asked as a think tank, why do we engage in the social issues? Why do we care about these? Well, I think Dr. Wilcox gave a great example why, because this does affect our nation. If you are concerned about what we can do to promote healthy relationships, I want you to connect with Janine McKenzie right here. Raise your hand, Janine. She works here in Colorado. She's probably the premier expert in the state of Colorado in promoting healthy relationships. So make sure you get a chance to connect with her. Can you stick around for a little bit? Great. Um, I also want to recognize one of our board of trustees members, Dr. Jerry Nelson. Thank you so much for coming out. Appreciate that. Kyle Ussery, member of the president's cabinet and all the professors. Thank you. And all the students. Thank you so much for coming out. This is our last distinguished lecture series for the year. We're getting close to graduation. Anyone graduating here? All right. I'll be on stage with you in just about a month. Congratulations. Um, I just want to let you know the Western Conservative Summit will be our next big event, July 12th through the 13th. We're going to be releasing our speaker list here soon. This is one of the largest gatherings of conservatives in the country, and we will be uh, defending religious freedom in America's First Amendment. But I want to highlight just real quick a handful of speakers that we have. Abby Johnson from Unplanned will be joining us for the Western Conservative Summit. She's the main character featured in Unplanned. And Pastor Andrew Brunson, who spent three years in a Turkish prison, was uh, rescued by the Trump administration and brought out. He's going to be speaking as well. So it gives you a sense of some of the great speakers we're going to have at the Western Conservative Summit. So I hope you'll join us for that. You can get tickets at our website at uh, ccu.edu slash centennial. Have a wonderful night. God bless you all. Thanks for coming.